This channel has had a lot of firsts recently. Its first 1,000 subscribers, its first Discord, and now it seems to have its first collaboration. As I seem to have caught the attention of an interesting new friend. <laughs> Looks like I'm here in pretty unfamiliar territory. Well, you all are unfamiliar with me, but I am not unfamiliar with Pokemon. My name is Devin, but I am better known as Plus Ultraman, and I usually run a channel where I attempt to tell realistic and narratively fleshed out what if scenarios on shonen battle manga such as Dragon Ball or the big three of Naruto, One Piece, and Bleach, for instance. But like many Americans growing up in the late 90s and 2000s, Pokemon permeated my childhood in a way that was nearly inescapable. And luckily, I was one of those kids who truly did love it to death. The anime was a major boon to that, and things like Digimon and other popular media coming from the East at the time did a lot to feed my love for the medium of anime and manga that I maintain to this day. So obviously, I've always wanted to try my hand at a Pokemon what if, leading to me presenting my new pal Ronin here with the following idea for a scenario which we both seemed to enjoy because as soon as we spoke about it, we were inspired with a pretty epic tale for the Pokemon multiverse. So. Plus Ultraman and I present to you What If Giovanni Sponsored Ash. In the world of Pokemon, the process of becoming a trainer and receiving a starter has always been interestingly vague. I mean sure, we have the well known a 10 year old somehow meets or is introduced to a region's leading Pokemon professor and given the choice of the three official starters of the region, always being a rare three stage grass, water, and fire trio. But just by looking at the world, we know every trainer doesn't really get that same opportunity. Really, just the player character in their individual Pokemon playthrough in the multiverse. Or including their rivals or the champions in some games. But we have characters such as the gym leaders in Elite Four, which while coming to specialize in a type, or in some cases a theme, have canonical starters that aren't the official starters of the region. I've always viewed this as a major strength of the series and being able to create a variety of interesting characters and pairings. That's why the concept of Pokemon sponsorships a lot of old fan fictions and quite recently Gen 8 reference, it's so intriguing. This concept is simply the idea that you are awarded your first Pokemon and possibly a few other perks such as a starting set of Pokeballs and some funds for example of something simple. Or in the case of player characters, we're always awarded a Pokédex as well so as to help the professor who is our sponsor better study the regions and the world of Pokémon. It's always a really easy way to explain why certain professors who probably don't need that much research from certain types of Pokémon still require you to have a Pokédex in game. The amazing thing is that this literally means anyone with access to a beginner level Pokémon and a Pokéball can sponsor someone else. For another example, imagine a parent is deciding to allow their child to go on a journey, but they can't afford to get to Professor Oak's lab. In this instance, the cheapest option for them would be to probably just catch a wild Pokemon for their child and have them start with that. And you have to note that this brings into account a lot of inherent disadvantages and advantages with certain timings, geography, migratory patterns of some Pokemon, social connections, etc, etc. But regardless, it means you can have a situation such as a gym leader deciding to sponsor a young trainer. In return, maybe you come back and work as a gym trainer like we see in the games, or you serve as a substitute leader while the main gym leader is away like we've recently seen in the Journeys anime. That idea, as well as the very obviously and widely explored fan concept of the connection between the characters of Giovanni and Ash, very obviously led to this scenario. To create this timeline, we will be using the plus style of attempting one major change at the beginning of a story which naturally leads to many other significant changes over time. We only need to change the circumstances behind Ash being sponsored by Professor Oak and some form of event that puts pre 10 year old Ash in the center of attention for Giovanni. Of course, you could also have the timeline where Giovanni from the beginning wants to sponsor trainers, but either way, you'd still pretty much end up in the same place. In this timeline, due to Ash's oversleeping habit, he ends up being unable to attend the summer camp Professor Oak hosted, which he met Serena at. A lot of people interpret this event to have been a major reason as to why Ash was sponsored by Professor Oak, so missing it makes him inconsolable, until his mom tries to cheer him up by explaining he could at least accompany her on an errand to Viridian City to retrieve a parcel for Professor Oak. There, the family of two are present for the surprising sight of Rampage and Rhyhorn. Citizens panic and some local trainers attempt to stop it or catch it, but its ability to bounce Pokeballs off its tough hide uncaptured and one shot mostly weak in common flying, bug, and normal types leads to the terrifying realization that this creature must have been one of the gym leader's Pokemon. 
meaning it was far too strong for the typical trainer to deal with and no one but its original trainer could control it likely. Clutching Ash's little hand in fear of the destruction, Delia Ketchum begins to try and make her way back to Pallet with her son, but defiantly, Ash slips his hand away from his mother before bolting towards the rampaging ground and rock type. Nearly having its head smashed by a rock blast that obliterated a war total that had been given the creature its biggest challenge. The young boy stood in front of Rhyhorn and in his own Ash way, confidently and calmly asked for it to calm down. The creature stared up at Ash uncaringly for a while before noticing a similar glint in his eyes as his master and relaxing finally. This boy was also a conqueror. At that moment, Giovanni finally entered the town square, calling to Rhyhorn and returning it as he calmed and apologized to the crowd explaining that a training accident had set the youngest member of his team off on a rampage. Meanwhile, Delia stormed up to her child and began scolding him furiously for doing something so dangerous. Behind her, the serious and stone-faced gym leader stood, waiting for her to finish all while Ash nervously attempted to warn her of the intimidating eavesdropper. Finally, his mother would notice and nervously play off her anger, only to then realize something and begin scolding Giovanni that he needed to be more careful and sensitive to his Pokemon's needs during training. Calmly. Kanto's most powerful gym leader agrees with Delia's point and asks her permission to thank her son for his help. Begrudgingly and with a blush, Delia steps aside, revealing Ash to be staring up at Giovanni with wide starry eyes. This is likely the first gym leader he's met before, and I think in return for having his gratitude, Ash asks to see the rest of his team, in which he of course obliges, going on to ask Ash if he likes Pokemon, and if he had plans to go out on a journey of his own which Ash confirms. Explaining that he is impressed and again indebted to the Ketchums, he proposes an opportunity to the family. He would like to sponsor Ash and give him his first starter in return for being able to call on Ash to do certain tasks when needed, such as covering him when he needs to step out as the gym leader or perhaps for training or other miscellaneous things. Ash again loses it and gets super excited, though his mother reminds him that he has the opportunity to get sponsored by Professor Oak instead, and that was also going to have the added benefit of coming with free storage and a top-of-the-line Pokedex, stressing the issue of instant gratification to her child. This does make Ash stop and reconsider, causing Giovanni to weigh his options. The truth was, he secretly ordered Rhyhorn to rampage through Viridian, at first to see if there may have been any trainers worthwhile taking under his wing, or possibly marking for a team of grunts to ambush and steal from. He is pretty thoroughly disappointed no one was up to any real form of snuff. Rhyhorn's reaction to the boy in front of him was intriguing though, and as someone who valued the power of an organization and slowly understanding more and more the need for full utilization of abilities of others, he wanted to be personally responsible for raising the next admins of Team Rocket. So ready to bargain, Giovanni elaborates that he isn't offering any old starter one could find here in the Kanto region. He intended to start Ash with a powerful species born from a Pokemon that he was planning to import into the region soon to add to his own team and have in rotation. A small lie, but one he could easily make a reality. A totally new Pokemon was intriguing to Ash, but the organization boss could see Delia completely unimpressed and growing irritated at the debate. Sweetening the deal a final time, he also mentions procuring a Pokedex and a place for Ash to store and have taken care of his Pokemon when not in use. Sweetening the deal a final time, Giovanni also mentions being able to procure a Pokedex and a place for Ash to store and have his Pokemon taken care of when not in use, as both were fairly simple things to do for a man with his stature. Then looking to Delia, he makes a somewhat solemn plea to take this offer, citing he sees a lot of potential in even himself and Ash. And this statement, along with Giovanni's general persuasiveness and cunning, lead to Delia agreeing to the offered sponsorship, changing this version of Ash's future forever. And she'd also note that she'd have to inform Professor Oak of this. The trio converse a bit more now with the tension settled, giving the Earth Badge Restorer a better time frame from when he's going to need to have Ash's Pokemon bred and ready to go. This was all certainly exciting and intriguing to him, and the situation was currently in his favor, as he'd have lots of Gem and Team Rocket business between here and then as well as the fact as he planned to repeat this little act of his at least twice more. His goal was to raise three admins with this little experiment of his and it would be a good way to gauge his success since he would have a control, so to speak. Returning all of his Pokemon and bidding the catches a farewell, he states to Delia that he will certainly be in contact with her and Ash so he can invite the boy out to the gym to watch a battle or two sometime. A sentiment Kid Ash is definitely all for, and his mother again is embarrassed as a suave and attractive person stating their intention to call you would do to anyone. I think Professor Oak would be simultaneously surprised. A bit down at losing a prospect he had likely had his eyes on and intrigued at Giovanni of all people 
for dueling out sponsorships as he is notoriously antisocial and hard-boiled, being the only gym leader in the Kanto region to dare enforce a badge requirement higher than 4 or 5, as well as the opportunity to study a foreign Pokemon as the Ketchums were neighbors as well as friends. And in many interpretations of the canon, Delia even has or currently works under Professor Oak at his lab. Surely, some other trainers worth sponsoring would come along. This may be more interesting in the long run though. From here, time will move on. Ash with every day growing more excited with the mystery surrounding his future partner. Knowing the choices already had him anxious, so he definitely would be bouncing off the walls. I think in lieu of that, as well as Professor Oak wanting to probe the situation further, Delia or Oak would sometimes bring Ash around the Viridian Gym to visit its leader, with him more often than not being unavailable. Over that time though, Giovanni makes sure to make at least some time for his future prospect. He has had to update him of the other two young trainers he has decided he would like to sponsor. One being a young man from a small Kanto city known as Prodomor City. He had actually been there with Team Rocket investigating the town's numerous Celebi sightings to try and harness the power of the time-traveling mythical creature. The final candidate had been under his nose the entire time. His own flesh and blood should have more than enough potential. Once on one of these trips, the gym had been closed longer than usual. Over these visits, Oak and Delia get a better feel for Giovanni, and his facade and charisma slowly fool them completely, as the entire world had been by him. The tiniest bit of warmth coming from his usually cold aura made the people feel special and welcomed and accepted by the man. Most would be always unaware of his simply using them as he did all things, tools to bring about an ambition. Oak is won over when he finally gets Giovanni to disclose the species he means to start Ash with, through revelation at first eliciting Oak's disapproval, but a smooth lie of breeding the species' natural surliness to be much more suppressed as for a beginner, the old professor is placated and once again excited for the concept of studying that line of Pokemon finally. Though this could also lead to Oak wanting to tutor Ash a bit more to prepare him for a more difficult starter just in case. This will also help to lead to an Ash that is a little more competent on his start since I don't think the start he has on canon would be anywhere near accessible to Giovanni. Whether out of genuine humor or open cruelty, Ash is still not allowed to learn what his starter is until his 10th birthday. There were things to keep him occupied though, such as there actually being the first gathering of the trio of Viridian City Gym sponsored trainers introducing Ash to Richie and a boy named Silver Giovanni introduced as his son. That day also saw a trainer challenging Giovanni, and wanting to inspire more loyalty out of his students, he explains that he has rotated a few of the parents of the starters they'd be using into his team today telling them to watch closely at how he used them for the day that Ash finally joined the other two as a 10 year old. The battle was very one sided, as a ride on Ash recognized was more than enough to deal with the trainer who stacked their team with advantageous types. Just when the trainer was down half of his six, Giovanni decided to switch out of boredom and wanted to see the children's reaction. As soon as the new Pokemon appeared, something in the back of Ash's head told him that this Pokemon was going to end up being his starter. The creature Giovanni called Crocodile then went on to defeat his first opponent and sweep through the other two seemingly growing more powerful as it battled and really impressing the three boys. Well, two, as Silver had actually gotten up and walked away, having seen his father crush the weak many times and simply stating this was nothing new. In interest of time, we skip to the day of Ash's 10th birthday, where as tradition, he does oversleep. But Giovanni, being the one for structure and not much for patience, surprises him by bringing the starter awarding ceremony to his home with an irate silver and a nervous Richie in tow. Embarrassed, Ash is quickly rushed to be made ready by his mother, and soon the group decides to travel over to Professor Oak's lab for this. This also being the day he handed out his starters, one of which being Ash's rival, Gary, who'd chosen Squirtle, just like in the canon. For those curious about him, Pikachu in this timeline is pretty much going unclaimed, and with its behavior issues, I think Oak would simply just release it since no one else needed a starter. That means it would likely stay nowhere around the pallet area. Gary, curious to see what Ash had gotten into, stayed around his grandfather's lab and sat next to him with his Squirtle, still not believing Ash had got eyed by the region's strongest gym leader. With the three in front of him, Giovanni reminds his students that he had decided to eliminate the choice of starters and specifically picked the Pokemon each of their individual talents would best be suited for. This is actually another lie, he just wanted to avoid childish argument. Now each equipped with their first Pokemon, the three young trainers released their partners inside. First was Richie, who looked down to see a small, bud-like Pokemon with beady eyes. 
He looked to Giovanni, who handed him what Oak clocked as an older model, but still very functional Pokedex, being more surprised to see it already had a National Dex feature installed. This made Oak a tad suspicious as to how Giovanni had them, but he was too enthralled with the moment to dig too deep though. The device instantly recognizes the creature as Trap Inch and recites one of the usual Dex entries, causing Richie to be impressed with its fabled power and declare they'll be an ultimate team. Finally, the meeting he had been waiting for took place as a small, sandy brown and striped reptile appeared in front of him and looked up at Ash. The boy was handed his Pokedex as well and told the creature's name is Sandile and it was the first form of Crocodile, the offspring of the one that Giovanni had. Ash excitedly got down to Sandile's level and introduced himself to the young ground type and stated his dream of being a Pokemon master. His response was a very restrained nod from the creature after a glance warily towards Giovanni before Sandile moved to stand at Ash's side making Oak again notice that the young creature already seemed extremely disciplined, where he expected at least a bit of rambunctiousness. Looking over, he finally noticed the final boy known as Silver had been gifted a rather large and healthy looking Rhyhorn. Oak could tell it was the offspring of one of Giovanni's main team members at a glance, so it was all the more shocking when Silver flipped out on his father, whose expression never changed. The redhead was furious his father had gotten these strangers rare Pokemon unobtainable in Kanto. Why was he the only one stuck with something he could get himself? Giovanni simply and sternly replied that as his own son, he thought it most fitting to give him the offspring of one of his most powerful team members and that he saw this as a testament to Silver's prowess. Somewhat also implying he expected Silver to go along with Team Rocket's goals earlier than the other two, but Silver didn't want to hear it and he actually stormed out of the room without Rhyhorn or his Pokeball, causing the young creature to look at Giovanni and show his confusion and even a bit of trepidation and sadness. Gary then raised his hand asking if it'd be alright if he took Rhydon with him. Giovanni would stare the boy down for a bit, causing the oak to be a little bit intimidated, but nonetheless holding his ground. Giovanni stated that he didn't care, thus bringing Gary's team to two and causing him to instantly feel no more jealousy over Ash. Not only did he too get Giovanni Pokemon, but he also got a second Pokemon before Ash. Telling Ash he'd smell him later, he ends up bolting out before Ash can challenge him to a battle to see who has more skill. Giovanni addresses Ash and Richie for a final time. He orders them to train hard and make strong teams, keep in contact with him whenever he may need them as well. And with that, he began to walk away. Ash and Richie have the same thought, both stopping him and asking them if they could have their first gym battles with him. This actually angers Giovanni at the audacity of it and having him sternly bark that they were centuries too early to even consider challenging him. Regaining his cool, he tells them to challenge him when they have seven or more badges. He then bids them farewell and he too left soon after. Dejected, Ash quickly recovers by asking Richie for his first battle, only for the similar boy to announce he is actually going back to his hometown so he could properly say goodbye to his parents and start his journey right. The two promise to make it up one day soon as they are sure that they were running to each other and they needed to make sure they stayed in contact. With the well-mannered sand dial in hand, Ash returns home where his mother says her goodbyes and bestows upon Ash a set of outfits for his journey ahead. Setting off on a Route 1, Ash and Sandile walk alongside each other with Ash excitedly speaking about all the things he and his partner would accomplish while Sandile again seems reserved and not really interested. This is when the first encounter of their journey happens and it is still with Pidgey. Even though Sandile is being obedient and Ash isn't having all those first time trainer issues, the Pidgey in this timeline gets spooked by Sandile when it instantly gets very aggressive when it's told it's time to battle, as his growls cause the starting bird to fly away. The nearby Rattata also fled at the sound of this. This time, the Spearow that is in the area actually hears these growls and takes notice of Ash first and gets jealous of the trained Sandile, instantly going in for an attack. Finally getting his battle, Ash remembers what his Pokédex had said and orders a Sand Attack and then a Leer before having Sandile use its only current attacking move at the time of Power Trip. This expertly takes the Flying type down in a single hit after having its defense lowered and causes Spearow to get up angrier than before, calling its flock in. Ash, now seeing the danger, tries to run, but Sandile for the first time does not listen to him. Ash notices again that his demeanor had changed and his aggressiveness was beginning to make it look like a different creature entirely. As the Spearow flock rushed in, Sandile went without orders and quickly began barreling through the unprepared birds. After a fourth knockout, Ash could clearly see that Sandile was turning red almost as a faint red aura leaked off of it in the same way he'd seen Giovanni's crocodile. 
it didn't take long before the entire flock was now battling and losing quite badly honestly to the quickly over leveling ground and dark type. Ash had already seen it begin using more and more of its moves that it couldn't before while going berserk. He definitely seen both scary face and bite and the ground around he and his starter was littered with enough fainted Spiro to lift the Viridian City gym, meaning it was clear that they had gone way too far. With rain and lightning setting in and the realization that Sandile was really starting to hurt the wild Pokemon, Ash began frantically trying to return it, but Sandile was too surly and agile to catch, and he was still surrounded by wild Pokemon. By the time the little crocodile stopped, every Spiro in the flock had fallen to him, causing it to remain on edge and scan the area for more enemies as Ash tried to approach it and calm it down. Just then, one Spiro, still conscious and realizing his flock was in greater danger than ever, gave a different call than before, and in return, received a much different sounding one in return. A cold shiver went down Ash's and Sandow's spine as thunder cracked and the tree the flock flew from whooshed as something flew from it. Stopping in the air above them and nearly blowing Ash off his feet as it flapped his wings, a large and mature Fero that was clearly too powerful to be going up against a starting trainer appeared in front of them, irritated by having his flock decimated. With his opponent in sight, Sandile instantly gets ready to fight again, but Ash wisely grabs it and begins booking it in the opposite direction. Though it had gotten stronger in a short amount of time, all the damage was going to add up at some point, and beyond that, this pharaoh was a monster. He was trying to get as far away from the predatory bird, which began to chase. Weaving and dodging through trees was ineffective, as pharaoh just cut them down and nearly impaled Ash several times. Finally, a stray branch causes him to trip just before pharaoh speeds up with enough power to nearly cut him down just like the trees, which just barely misses him as they fall by Ash diving out of the way, still cradling Sandile. The little creature had only ever had one interaction with its mother and Giovanni, so discipline and repression were impressed on its very young mind. He had been hatched, fed from time to time, and then given orders by the menacing Giovanni, who had his mother and a powerful looking Persian to back his words. But this was something it had never experienced. Giovanni treated him, his mother, and all Pokemon like tools, but this this human, he acted as if Sandile was truly precious to him. Ash grabbed a tree branch and began swinging it to fend off the pharaoh while ordering Sandile to run, but surprising him, the creature instead jumped over his head and ended up using its bite attack on pharaoh's wing, just catching it and sinking in to hold on for dear life as pharaoh flapped hard and screeched in pain and annoyance. Realizing Sandile was protecting him, the fear Ash had begun to feel watching it massacre the sparrow melted away a bit as he couldn't help but scream out Sandile that he believed in it. Just then, a bolt of lightning came striking from the sky and miraculously went right into the little ground type who, while unaffected by the current, did an amazing job of shocking the Fero who dropped to the ground, smoking and fainted alongside Sandile. It soon calmed itself, easily aware nothing near them would challenge it, and finally gave Ash an expression that wasn't blank or aggressive as it smiled softly and also fainted. Realizing Pharaoh was in far worse shape than the Sparrow, which would likely be alright with just a few weeks worth of rest, Ash had no choice but to catch it and bring it along with him as he began to run towards Viridian and the nearest Pokemon Center. Because of the emergency and already having to run a good portion of the route by running much faster and further from the Pharaoh than he would have just by running away from a flock with Sparrow, Ash does still run into Missy and does still take her bike, yelling he'll pay her back someday. This time, upon reaching Viridian City and getting his Pokemon to nurse Joy, Ash feels compelled to go to the gym to tell Giovanni, but he isn't there. This causes him to return to the center and contact him, having a similar phone call with Professor Oak and his mother, finally trying to contact Giovanni, once again only to find the irate man on a helicopter, asking him what he needed. A bit shamefully, Ash apologizes to his sponsor and admits that he's already failed to protect Sandow and control it, explaining the situation with the Spiro flock and Sandow's strange behavior. But Giovanni stopped him by stating that was his partner's special ability called Moxie, something Ash vaguely recalled Professor Oak teaching him about. This made Ash theorize that the adrenaline from the attack boost Moxie gave made Sandow hard to rein in. Giovanni then looked down at something for a bit before widening his eyes and smirking to Ash. Right now, the boy was doing very well for himself. Sandile was sitting at level 18 already and would soon have access to some of his egg moves. While the Pharaoh he caught seemed to be fairly powerful, though it wouldn't be listening to him anytime soon since his level was already 34. This does make Ash feel a little better, but he reminds Giovanni that he and Sandile hurt a lot of Pokemon they didn't have to. 
Knowing now was the time to slowly begin transitioning Ash into the reality of his situation, Giovanni was a bit more authentic than he'd usually be with the kid, stating that one day Ash would just have to realize that some things are stepping stones to his goal. To placate Ash though, he mentions he would have some associates of his take care of the Spiro before he coldly cut off the transmission. From behind Ash, a gash sounds and he turns to see the girl whose bike he had borrowed, causing him to instantly begin apologizing. Though Giovanni's cold statement to Ash and his earlier theft instantly coloring Missy's perception of Ash as much more of a jerk in the original timeline, causing her to begin berating the little punk, who she assumed was his dad or something, having not gotten a good look at the man on the screen. Like with Silver, Ash bristles at the disrespect of his sponsor, causing he and Missy to begin a full-blown argument in the Pokemon Center and causing Nurse Joy to order them to go outside sternly. Now kicked out, the two scream at each other until they were out of breath when Ash finally decides to challenge Misty to a battle once his Pokemon were healed. Misty would confidently accept only for Ash's name to be called as Nurse Joy announced that his team's treatment being completed and he was given another earful about their condition and his behavior. Meeting Misty back outside and heeding Giovanni's words, he knew he'd have to depend on Sandile, who once again was nice and reserved, though now looked happy to see him. Misty couldn't identify the Pokemon, but she wasn't backing down and sent out her Staryu, causing Sandile to once again shift into what Ash began labeling as battle mode, growling and hissing as it awaited a command. Instantly, Ash feels a flash of the fear he'd felt while on Route 1. Just knowing why Sandow went berserk wouldn't stop it from doing so again, and this time, a person would be on the other side of him, and people were nowhere near as durable as Pokemon. With his bravado gone and a nervous sweat, Ash apologized to Misty and drops her some money in return for borrowing her bike. Slash his forfeit before for the second time that day, he ran away from something scary. He realized that Sandow and he had a lot of work to do, and he honestly wasn't sure if he was up to handle it on his own. But this is where we'll be leaving our story off for right now. All right, you guys, that's all we have for part one of what if Giovanni sponsored Ash. What do you guys think about this concept? It was something that I actually hadn't even thought of. I really got to thank Plus Ultraman for taking point on this, as this is my first collaboration, and he really led the way. He has a lot of knowledge, and he's really doing a lot to help me and grow my channel, especially with this collaboration. So I just want to personally take the time to thank him and to welcome any and all new subscribers that have come to my channel from his channel and to please encourage my subscribers to go to his channel and check out his content. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. But anyway, with all that being said, please let us know what you guys thought about the concept down in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please make sure to give it a like and don't forget to subscribe for more future content. And also, don't forget to follow both of us on Twitter and our other social media platforms. All will be linked in the description below. Anyway, I'm Ronan Charizard, and I will see you in the next video.